bless the Lord, O my soul. Amen. Amen. All that is within me, bless His holy name. Amen. Amen. Let's open our Bibles together to the book of Ephesians, third chapter, beginning in verse 14 here in just a moment. As it had been good to go on this journey together through the book of Ephesians. Amen. Our pastor, Dr. Valdez, has led us. And last uh, two Sundays ago, Brother Lee preached his first sermon. I thought he did a great job. Amen. Amen. All four of his points were right from the scripture. He told me before he preached it, he said, Brother Mark, I'm going to start with the text, stay with the text, and stop with the text. <laughs> That's exactly what he did. He did a great job. So, Pastor, I appreciate you giving him that opportunity. And I appreciate the good leadership you've given us through the book of Ephesians. If you're open to the book of Ephesians, chapter 3 and verse 14, would you stand to your feet? And would you repeat this with me as we commit this passage to the Lord this morning? Dear Father, Dear Father, Father I hold your word in my hands. I hold your word in my hands. And now may I hear it with my ears. And now may I hear it with my ears. And hide it in my heart. And hide it in my heart. And honor it in my life. And honor it in my life. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Ephesians, the third chapter, beginning in verse 14. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. And I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations and forever and ever. Amen. May God bless his word to our hearts. You may be seated. This morning I want to just spend a few moments sharing with you Paul's beautiful prayer for the believers at Ephesus. And indeed it was a beautiful prayer. It was a powerful prayer. And it was a needed prayer. He was so fervent about it and so serious about this prayer that he petitioned God with that when he prayed he fell down to his knees there in his jail cell in Rome. And he lifted up his voice to God and he planned on behalf of all the believers in Ephesus these four very important things. Things that were absolutely necessary if they were going to continue in Christ and to be able to grow in Christ and be able to serve Christ faithfully as the church of Ephesus did. If Christ was going to be their first love, God needed first to answer this fourfold prayer that Paul petitioned the Lord with. You know, he had shared with the Ephesians so many wonderful things about the great riches of God how he had seated each and every one of us in the heavenly places and blessed us in the heavenly realms. Amen. And he had performed that great miracle that really revealed the great mystery of the church. That those who were once afar off were brought near 
by the very blood of Christ. And as our pastor preached from last week, that great mystery of the church, that now even the Gentiles were heirs of the great riches of God. And they were members of His body, the church, and partakers in the promises of Christ. I'm grateful for that because a Gentile I am. I'm glad that Jesus even died for me. Amen? And with all the wonderful blessings of God placed upon Jew and Gentile alike, and all the great things that He has bestowed upon His children, Paul began to realize that it needed to mean something to the believers. What a shame it is as I look at Christianity nowadays and look upon churches nowadays, and with a broken heart, I see a group of people who believe the gospel, but it doesn't really seem to matter all that much. Who believe the Bible with all their hearts, but it doesn't seem to matter all that much. That they haven't truly had the great change in their life that the gospel demands of each and every one of us. They go about their lives as though they've never been touched by the Lord at all, while still believing in him. Paul certainly recognized that could be a possibility with those believers in Ephesus. That they have heard the great truths of the gospel. That they have been they've had bestowed upon them the great riches of God in the heavenly realms. That they have been made heirs of the kingdom, members of the body of the church partakers of the great promises of Christ, and yet, in the end, it really not matter that much at all. And so he did something that was very important on their behalf. There he was in that Roman jail cell for the sake of the gospel, and he fell down on his knees before the Lord, and he began to petition the Lord and to pray for these believers back in Ephesus. He prayed on his knees because it was a prayer of great urgency and great fervency before the Lord. For he realized that all the words that he had penned in his letter would have no effect unless he prayed. Every word that the Ephesians had heard as he had preached the gospel to them would have no effect unless he prayed. And all the preaching that he would do about the gospel and about the very glory of God would have no effect without fervent prayer. Pastor, one thing that I'm very grateful for today is week after week we have great preaching from this pulpit. Even though every once in a while I have to fill in. But isn't it good to know we've been fed the word of God week by week. But all of that might mean nothing unless we learn to pray. I've noticed something as I studied this text this week. That is, when he fell down on his knees, Paul recognized that two things had already taken place. You'll notice in chapter 3, he says, Surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is the mystery made known by, to me by revelation, as I've already written briefly. He says, you've heard it. You've heard the great truth about the administration of this great mystery concerning the church. That even you Gentiles have been chosen to be heirs and members of the body, partakers of the promises. You've heard it. Let me tell you something there. Hearing it didn't mean that it was going to matter that much. Some of us are really great hearers and not very good doers when it comes to the Word. I've noticed that in my own life, that sometimes I'm a better hearer of the Word than a doer of the Word. Amen? It's easy to hear it. It's much harder to do it. It's easy to hear a great gospel message, but oh, for it to really matter in our life and take root in our life. You can be the best hearer in the world, and yet it really not matter much 
when there's no fruit that's born from that which you have heard. Paul, after recognizing that they have heard and heard it well, he realized that still he needed to pray for these believers. Because sometimes when hearing fails, prayer can prevail. Perhaps they didn't hear the right things or hear it the right way or give it the right application. And so he fell down on his knees and he prayed to God that that which he had preached to them would really matter to them and would truly change their lives. But not only did he recognize that they had heard it, but he also recognized that he himself had preached it. Verse 7, he says, I became a servant of the gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of His power. Although I am less than the least of all of God's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Indeed, that's exactly what he did. His message wasn't empty. His message wasn't meaningless. His message was full of God and all of His riches and it was full of Jesus. Amen? And he says, And to make plain to everyone the administration of this ministry for which the age past was keeping in God who created all things. He says, I preached it. And I preached it fervently. I preached it with the power of God in my life. Sometimes just as hearing can fail, preaching can fail. But when hearing fails and preaching fails, maybe prayer can prevail. He says, I, I, I know that you've heard it, and I know that I've preached it. But even now, he says, I'm falling urgently, passionately upon my knees in prayer. And I'm praying for you that that which you have heard and that which I have preached would really, really mean something. They would, would take root in your life and they, it would so transform your life that you'll never be the same again. Pastor, my prayer for us as preachers of the Word of God is that we would never preach until we've prayed. And after we've preached, that we'll pray some more that that which we have been given by God to share with others would really matter. Amen? Amen. That would really make a change in the lives of believers. And so Paul, as he fell upon his knees in prayer, he could have prayed in any position, you know, there in that jail cell. There was no one to really see him or know what he was doing. He could have prayed standing up. He could have prayed while he was still laying down before going to sleep or after sleeping. He could have prayed uh, sitting down. He could have prayed in any position. But he says, I, I fell to my knees and I prayed for you. It was really one of the marvelous positions of prayer because it was a prayer that showed humility before God. It showed utter dependence upon Him. Here was a subject coming to His sovereign and pleading with Him, begging with Him this one thing that God, that that which they have heard and that which I preached would really matter. That it would transform their lives forever. And you'll notice what he said. He said, I, I prayed to the Father. I prayed to your Father and to my Father. I prayed to our Father. He said, I prayed to the Father by whom every uh, group in heaven and on earth has received its name. He's reminding them all over again that whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, we share the same Father. Amen? Amen. And He's not just our God who reigns above us, but He is our Father who loves and cares so deeply for each and every one of us. He says, I pray to our Abba, our Father. That was really the name for Daddy. The one that is so dear to all of us because we are so dear to Him. And I came to Him and I prayed for you, He says to the Ephesians. For four things. Now I want you to notice that as he tells them what he prayed for them about, that these four things are all preceded by one same, one common word. And that is the word that. 
T-H-A-T. He uses that word four times in specifying to them the four different things that he was praying for them concerning. And I want you to notice as you look again, beginning in verse 16, he says, I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your in inner being. That's the first that. Do you see that? That's the first that. Notice the second that that he prayed about. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And then he says in verse in verse 17 again, And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. He says, I want you to know the unknowable and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. And then the next that, the fourth that, that you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of of God. He uses four that's so that they would know what he was praying for them concerning. You'll notice what the first one was. He says, I fell on my knees before the Father and what I prayed was that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through His Spirit in your inner being. What a great prayer that was. Because Paul recognized that that which he had preached to them had very little to do with their outer being. It had everything to do with their inner being. The very control center of each and every one of our lives. It affects our hearts in our mind, and who we are inwardly. I'm afraid that we live in a world today in which there's a lot of outward Christianity, not much inward Christianity. There is an outward gospel that says you can depend on God to meet all of your needs no matter what they are, and people will put on this facade as being true believers where inwardly there's been no change and no revolution in their life. How many of you recognize today that Christ, when he begins to work on us, he begins the inward out, not the outward in? It is in your inner being in which a change needs to take place. Amen. And Paul, when he said he was praying for the Ephesians, he was saying to them, I want you to know that you must not neglect the inner man. The inner man is what truly matters. And if the gospel doesn't change your inner man, it's not changed you at all. And if my preaching is going to matter, if you're hearing my preaching is going to matter, you've got to open up your heart and your life and your very being to God and let Him come in. Amen. Amen. Oh, what a wonderful thing it is that God wants to come in us. That God wants to reside in us through His Holy Spirit. Now, you'll notice what it is that he said about this. He says that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. Now, how is it that God begins to strengthen us in our inner being and cause us to have a true change in our life? It is through the ministry of his Holy Spirit. Now, listen, I grew up a Baptist. Most of that time as a Southern Baptist. And I'll tell you this for sure. Many, many Baptists today have almost forgotten altogether that there is a Holy Spirit. Yeah. And may we never forget that there is. Some people are afraid of the Holy Spirit. When you start talking about the Holy Spirit, someone think, might think you're a charismatic. Well, maybe we need a little bit more charismatic in all of us. Amen? <laughs> because the Holy Spirit is real. Amen. Do you realize that in this passage, in three different ways, 
The Trinity is brought to life in us so that the Holy Spirit may be in us. That's this verse. That Christ may dwell in you and that the fullness of God may find its full measure in you. And I pray to the Father for all of that. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. How many of you recognize that all of them are important? The three persons of the Trinity. Amen. And the most neglected in many of our lives has been the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit that God sent to us for a reason. Because it's through the Holy Spirit that we're strengthened in the inner man. As he begins to work in us. Uh, before the New Testament, by the way, the Holy Spirit didn't dwell inside anybody. The Holy Spirit would only dwell on somebody. But when Jesus came and died on the cross and was raised from the dead and then ascended into heaven, he sent his Holy Spirit. That's right. That's right. He told his disciples when he did that, he said, don't worry, the, the paraclete, the comforter, the Holy Spirit is coming. Amen. And when he comes... He will indwell you. And he will empower you. So that you can preach the gospel and do all sorts of wonderful things in my name. But, but wait for the Holy Spirit because you can't do it apart from him. Why? Because they were weak. But the Holy Spirit is strong. Amen. Amen. So they waited for him. And when the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost and filled them they began to preach with power. A message which before they could have never preached. And one day 3,000 people came to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Because that's the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, the Ephesians were just as helpless and hopeless without the Holy Spirit as the disciples were. They needed that same Holy Spirit in their lives if they were going to have power in the inner man. They knew what it was like to be weak in the inner man. They knew what it was like to live in darkness. In fact, if you just turn over a, a page or so in your Bible to the fifth chapter yeah. of Ephesians, you'll see how they once lived. Apart from God in their life and apart from the Holy Spirit in their life, he says, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Isn't it marvelous the change that Jesus makes in the life of a person? He brought them from utter darkness of sin to the light of his son. But then he, he gives this challenge. He says, you, you need to live as children of the light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. <laughs> Most of them realized that that wasn't so easy to do. In fact, uh, most of them would, re would recognize that that was very difficult unless something meaningful and significant took place, and that is the Holy Spirit came inside of them. And that the Holy Spirit began to strengthen that which was weak and to make them strong in the Lord. And so he goes on to say, and find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them, yes. for it is the shameful even to mention even mention what the disobedient do in secret, but everything exposed by the light becomes visible, for it is light that makes everything visible. That is why it said, Wake up, O sleeper, rise up from the dead, and Christ will shine upon you. Well, that's what needed to happen to the Ephesians. They were dead in sin. They were dead in darkness. They needed to wake up. They needed to get out of their slumber and rise from their dead and let Christ shine upon them. And that's exactly what he did through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. They came into their lives and empowered them and strengthened them in their inner being. And so he says, be very careful then how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because you know the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. And how do you do that? Notice what he says. And do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. He says, that's what you used to do. But no more. But instead what? Instead be filled with the Spirit. Amen. Be filled with the Spirit. It's a strange thing what wine does to the human mind. 
It begins to captivate it. It begins to control it. Debauchery means a loss of self-control. He says, don't get, get drunk on wine, which leads to that, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And get under His control, and you can live the kind of life that God wants you to live. Amen? Amen. But apart from Him, you can't do it. Life is either lived in the power of the flesh or in the power of the Holy Spirit of God in your life. And Paul, as he thought about all the great riches of God, about all the grace that he bestowed upon Jew and Gentile alike, he realized that all the glorious truth and glory of the gospel itself would be meaningless and empty after he preached it if he didn't fall on his knees before God and say, oh God, let it make a difference in their lives. And I pray, oh God, that you will just open up their hearts so that you may come into the inner man through the power of your Holy Spirit and transform them. And I'll tell you today, I think it needs to be the prayer of Dr. Valdez and the prayer of this preacher and the prayer of each and every one of us are here today that we pray for ourselves and we pray for one another that we may never forget the Holy Spirit. I'm afraid that today if you took the Holy Spirit out of this world and out of the life of every single believer, for most believers it wouldn't make a difference at all. Because they know nothing of the Holy Spirit in their lives. But I pray that there wouldn't be one single man or woman, boy or girl, that would leave this place today not knowing that the Holy Spirit is in control of their lives and that they're saying, Hallelujah, praise the Lord. I am being strengthened in my inner man because of the power of the Holy Spirit in my life. Which feeds to me the very Word of God. Which shows me the very ways of God. That keeps me within the will of God. That convicting power of the Holy Spirit. That controlling power of the Holy Spirit. Don't ever forget the importance of the Holy Spirit in your life. Amen? Amen. Paul says, that's what I pray for you. And I am so convinced and convicted that the Holy Spirit and His role in your life is so very important that I fall down on my knees and I plead with God that out of His abundant riches that He may pour into your life the very power of the Holy Spirit. Then there is something else he prayed for them. The second that that we see. In verse 17, He may strengthen you with power through the Spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. He really says the whole reason that you really need the Holy Spirit, by the way, in your life is so that you can have a heart that's fit for the dwelling place of Jesus Christ Himself. Now, there are different words for dwelling or for living that we see in the New Testament. This one is, is quite unusual and quite telling. Because it is a word that means not just that the whole that God through Jesus Christ can live in your heart but that he can feel at home in your heart a word really of great richness and great depth of a difference between living in someone somewhere because that's just where you happen to live and you never really felt at home there as opposed to you live where you live and you feel at home there. You're comfortable living there. You feel like this is where I belong. Now may I ask you a question about your own heart and your own inner man, your own inner being? Is your heart the kind of heart transformed by the very power of God through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in your life that Jesus can make himself at home in your heart. I, I think back to the book of Genesis when God was having to deal with the whole issue of Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember the story. And God wanted to meet with two different individuals 
in order to know how to deal with Sodom and Gomorrah. So he dispatched two of his angels and he came down to earth and he moved into Abraham's tent. Abraham, a man who was walking with God, Abraham, the great father of the faith, Abraham, a man who had given his whole life and heart and inner being to God. And what the scripture says is that God and those two angels moved into his tent and they made themselves quite comfortable there. They fellowshiped with Abraham in that tent. They even sat and ate a meal with Abraham in that tent. They felt like that was where they belonged because they were with a man who was truly a man of God. They found great comfort there. Wouldn't it be wonderful if God could find great comfort in your home? That there would be nothing in your home that would cause him discomfort. That there would be nothing unholy or unrighteous or not so good in your home that God would not want to be there. That God wouldn't want to sit down at your table and have fellowship with you. But oh, when our hearts are clean and pure. That's the kind of heart that Jesus can live in. Amen? Find comfort there. But then it came time to rise up and go into Sodom to meet with Lot. They needed to go to Lot's house. God and his angels did in Sodom. And you know what God did? He dispatched his two angels. He said, you all go ahead. I won't step foot into that city. I won't step foot into Lot's house. There's too much evil there. There's too much sin and depravity there. I, I just wouldn't be comfortable there. I can't live in a place like that. And he sent his angels. That's the same type of word that was used here for the Lord Jesus Christ dwelling in the hearts of believers. Paul's prayer to them was so that Christ can dwell in your hearts through faith. That you would be so transformed in your inner being by this message that you have heard, this message that I have preached to you, that it would matter so much that it would so change your hearts and so wash your hearts and so clean out all the dirtiness of your hearts that Jesus can find comfort living there. That it's a place that's worthy of him to dwell. Now I want you to realize this. Is, is that I believe that when we come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he forgives us of, of our sin. Amen? Amen. He cleanses us of all of our unrighteousness. Amen? Amen. But it doesn't mean that we still don't uh, carry a little dirt around in our hearts. That's why Paul said, I need, the Holy, I need you to know that the Holy Spirit needs to come in and transform your inner being so that Christ may live in a place that's comfortable to Him. And you know what you need to do every day? You need to recognize that your heart is His temple, His house, His dwelling place. If God were to speak to me from heaven and say, Brumball, listen, I'm, I'm going to come to your house today. I would go home and clean up as quickly as I could. <laughs> Those dishes I left undone because I was sick all week would get cleaned real quick. Amen. I would vacuum my floor. I would dust my furniture. I would do everything I needed to do to make my house perfect for him. Amen? Amen. And every single day when we wake up and look at ourselves in the mirror, we ought to say, what in my house needs to be cleaned? What in my heart? So that Jesus could be comfortable living there. I'm so glad that he moved in when I was saved. But I wonder, can he really be comfortable there with everything that's in my heart today? You ask the Holy Spirit to use his power to clean your heart so that Jesus has a comfortable place to stay. It's a great prayer. It's a great prayer. I wish you to notice the third thing he prayed for them. The third, that. In the middle of verse 17, and I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long 
and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. You know what he prayed for them? He says, I pray that you might comprehend the incomprehensible. That you might know the unknowable. That you might ascertain that which is unascertainable. That you might come to understand that which nobody could possibly ever understand. And that is the great magnitude of God's love. And I pray that you come to understand that in order that you might be grounded and rooted in it. You'll notice how he expresses it. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love. He reaches first of all to the world of agriculture. And he realizes that if you're going to grow a plant, it needs to establish good roots. Amen? Amen. I think of the words that Paul or that, that, that David wrote in, in Psalm 1-1 about the tree that's planted by water. That if you're going to live a godly life, you've got to be separated from the world and you've got to be saturated with the word, but you've got to be situated by the waters. And those roots have to, to grow deep into the soil of godliness. And he says, establish, he's reaching into the world of architecture. He's thinking about building a building and how it needs to be established upon a firm foundation. Praise God we have that in Jesus Christ. Yeah. A foundation upon which to build our lives. And upon His love that He has shown to each and every one of us. He says, my prayer is that you're going to be rooted in your relationship with God and founded, grounded on that love of Jesus Christ in your life. <coughs> Boy, what a great way to be established in the Lord Jesus Christ is to do it on the foundation of His love. And then he begins to describe God's love. It's, all of us know that it can't ever be described. If someone were to ask you, tell me, tell me about the love of God, there are no words that adequately define it. Paul says so whenever he expresses it this way. So that and I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. He thinks of it in all of its dimensions. How long it is, how wide it is, how high it is, how deep it is. It's really His way not to think of those things individually, although we're going to try to in just a moment. But rather say, if you consider all the dimensions and the great scale of God's love, it's beyond human comprehension. You'll never be able to understand it. It's so, it has such magnitude and such magnificence that no words could ever, ever describe just how great God's love is. Amen? Well, yeah. oh, what a great love God has for each and every one of us. I don't understand it. I don't understand my Ford F-150. I have no idea how that thing works. All I know is it works. Probably some of you could try to sit me down and explain to me how an internal combustion engine works, how, how an injection engine works, how this works and how that works. Brother Husto told me he's about to learn how a transmission works as they're struggling with that. I don't know how all that stuff works. Praise God, I know how to work it. I may not know everything there is to know about God's love because as he says here, it is beyond our ability to know. But I know I have it, amen? And when I know that I have the very love of God in all of its magnitude, it matters to me. It changes me. He says, consider how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the very love of God. Have you ever thought about that? About how wide His love is? For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son. Amen. 
that God demonstrated his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, each and every one of us, Christ died for us. How wide is God's love? It's so wide it can encompass every single one of us. It holds each and every one of us in his arms. When Jesus was at, when, when you ask me how much Jesus loves you, I would tell you exactly the way he did. He loves you this wide. He stretched out his hands. And my children, I get to see them. If I'm seeing my daughter, which I did two weeks ago, I will again in two weeks when she turns 26 on her birthday on May 12th. Then I'll see her about two weeks after that when she gets married. But if I were seeing just my daughter, I would open my arms this wide and I would embrace her and just squeeze her. But oh, if it's my daughter and my son, I've got to open my arms a little bit wider. To grab them, squeeze them, hold them. God reached his wide as wide could be in order that he can embrace the entire world with his love. There's not one single soul who ever lived, nor will there ever be one who ever will live that God didn't love. Aren't you glad his love is wide? How wide and how long hey, is the I God of love, is the love of God? Well, how long is it? Well, the Bible calls it an everlasting love. From the everlasting past to the ever-loving present to the ever, I mean, the everlasting present to the everlasting future. From eternity to eternity, God has loved us. Before the foundations of the world were ever laid, Jesus was slain because of the great love of God for humanity. Long before this world was created, he began to love us. Long after this world is destroyed, he will still love us. He'll love us for all of eternity. Amen. Amen. How wide is the love of God and how long is the love of God? God has shown his compassion on us that he has separated us from our sins as far as the east is from the west. You ever wonder why the scripture says the east and the west and not the north and the south? But if you were to travel north, if you traveled north long enough and just kept traveling north, you would suddenly find south and begin going south. If you travel south long enough, you'll soon find the north and continue on a northern route. That north and south really aren't that far apart. But if you were to get on a jet plane today and you were to begin to head west until you met east, you would travel for all of eternity and never find east because the two never meet. Oh, what a wonderful thing it is that God has separated our sin by his magnificent love as far as the east is from the west. It shows how eternal and how infinite the love of God is for all of us. He loves us so much. Then there's the height of God's love. As I read in Psalm 103, it says, As far as the heavens are above the earth, so is the love of God for each and every one of us. Do you know how far the heavens are above the earth? In the vastness of outer space, and the great expanse of emptiness of outer space. Millions and billions and trillions of light years you could travel and still never find the end of it. God's love is like that, amen? And how deep is his love? It's able to deep, reach as deep as we need it to reach. In all the darkness of my sin, in all the desperate hours of my life, in the darkest moments, in the deepest valleys, I'm reminded of what it was that David said in Psalm 23, that though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death itself, Thou art with me. Thy rod and thy, cat, thy, thy staff, they comfort me. Aren't you glad that in your deepest, darkest valleys, God's love is able to reach low enough to embrace each and every one of us? Paul even himself had said, I'm the most undeserving of all the apostles. I'm the one who was most 
unworthy of his love, but even in the depth of my sin, God reached down from heaven and saved me. Paul could say, like hopefully any one of us, is I know something about the very width and the very length and the very height and the very depth of God's love because I encountered it myself. And do you realize as you read through all the epistles, 27 books that in the New Testament, most of them written by Paul himself, over half of them. And when you read through all of the things that he had written, so much of what compelled him was the very love of Christ in his life. In fact, he even said to the Corinthians, the love of Christ compels me. You know what will change your life, your inner man, more than anything else is when you begin to grasp the very length in breath, the height and the depth of God's love for each and every one of us. Paul says, that's what I pray for for you. That you might come to understand just how much he loved you and let that change your life in a radical way. But I want you to notice the fourth that. The fourth thing that he prayed for them. In, in verse 19, you may be filled to the measure of all of the fullness of God. He says, think about it. When in your inner me, in your inner being, God begins to change you through the power of the Holy Spirit that convicts you about that which is wrong and right, and He begins to confront you with the Word of God. It begins to take control of your life so that your plate, your heart becomes a comfortable place for Jesus to live. And as he's living there, you begin to experience the very love of God that you can't measure. And you can't ever really know it in all its fullness, but you can live in its fullness. That your heart would become so filled with God that there's not room for anything else at all. That's really what he prayed for. Notice those words again. That you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Can you imagine what it would be like to have your life so filled with God that there's not room for anything else but Him? You know, when you got married, that was kind of your wife's expectation concerning her, amen? that your life would be so filled with her, gentlemen, that you would have no room for any other woman in your life. And probably she made sure that that's the way it was. Why? Because she was a jealous woman, and she should be, amen? Well, God is a jealous God. He's so jealous for each and every one of us. He says, I don't want there to be room for anything else in your life but me. That which is pleasing to me, that which is my will, that which is my way for you. That which is my word that I've spoken to you. I, I don't want there to be room for worldliness in your life. I don't want there to be any waywardness. I don't want there to be any wickedness. I want you to be fooled to the full measure of me in your life. Do you know why it was that when Jesus became man, he did not sin? Do you know why it was that when he walked this earth, it was tempted in every way just as we are, yet he was without sin? Because the book of Galatians says that when he came into this world, in him dwelt the fullness of God, all the deity in bodily form. There was no room in him for sin. There was no room in him for disobedience. He was so filled with God, there was no more room in his heart for anything else. And that's what Paul's prayer for us is. That your heart might be full to the full measure, the fullness of God, so that there's not room for anything else at all. Those were the four that's. Did you get all that? <laughs> well, were they the things that he prayed for those Ephesian believers? He says, I pray that God would fill you with His Holy Spirit and the power of His Holy Spirit in your life. I pray that your heart would become the dwelling place of Christ 
where he can dwell in your heart with comfort and be at home in you. And I pray that you will grasp the very power of his love that it might transform your life. And I pray that all of that will culminate in this is that, is, that, is that God will fill your life to capacity so that there's not room for anything else. And where your hearing may have failed to achieve that, where my preaching may have failed to achieve that, I fall on my knees and I pray that. Why? Because of the urgency of it in your life, the importance of it in your life. And then he ends it with this great doxology in verse 20. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all that we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever. Amen. How great is your God? You know, you begin to think about all the things. You begin to imagine about all the things that you think God's capable of. Paul says you haven't even stretched the surface. To him is able to do immeasurably more than you could ever ask, you could ever imagine. According to his power who is at work within us. You know what the problem with us is that sometimes we just limit God and His significance in our lives. Don't you dare do that. Amen? Amen. You begin to recognize who God can be in your life, the way He can transform your life, and you can't help but do what Paul says here. To Him be all the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all the generations here on earth and throughout all of eternity forever and ever. To Him be glory. Pastor Irby, I, I just think that um, this was a great prayer that Paul gave. Amen. Amen. And he gave it on his knees in a prison cell for those Ephesian believers. And I would like for you, Pastor, to come as pastor of this flock and to pray the same things for each believer here. Isn't it great to know that we have a pastor who prays for us? Perhaps you would want to get up, come get up out of your seat and come to this altar and say, you know, those four things are what I need. I need the Holy Spirit to fill my life. I need to have a heart that Jesus can be comfortable living in. I need to be impacted by the magnificent love of God in my life that compels me to live for Him. And I want my heart to be so filled with God but there's room for nothing else. Is that your prayer today? Do you need that prayer? Then I'm going to challenge you to stand up, come down here, and let your pastor pray for us. Stay up here with me, brother. Go together. I see you as a, as a co laborer here in the great work that God has given us here in the Spirit. Now, I'm going to ask if you are a, a, a leader in a ministry, I'm going to specifically invite you to come. If you are a uh, serving in a ministry, if you have a need, again, let's let's pray together this prayer together. Uh, do you believe in the power of prayer? Do you believe that prayer works? That prayer is real? And if the Lord leads you to come and to, to join us as we pray, not just leaders, but anyone here, if God is beckoning you to come and pray with us, let's gather together. Let's pray. Let's pray. And if you're able to, stand uh, as, we, as we go to the Lord in prayer. Oh, Lord, Father, I thank you for this wonderful message. I thank you for giving me a friend and a co-laborer in my brother Mark, who is such a joy to work with, who has been such a blessing to this church. Lord, more importantly, it's not about us. Lord, it's not, it's not about any individual. It's about you. And Lord, I thank you because you've called us and given us the great privilege to be here in this church and to proclaim the gospel without apology, to be able to share the goodness, the goodness of the gospel, the goodness of walking with you, Lord Father, the goodness, the goodness of knowing the one true Lord and King in our Son, in your Son, Jesus Christ, Lord Father. And so I thank you, Lord, for that great privilege that we have here. And Lord, as my, my brother Mark said, oh Lord, that we can understand the fullness, that we can seek 
to understand the immeasurable riches that you've given to us, Lord Father. That we may understand that you've, you've equipped us with your Holy Spirit in a time never before seen. Holy Spirit that equips us and strengthens us and guides us. You've called us, Lord Father, to seek you and to understand you so that we may be filled to the brim, overflowing with nothing but the love of God so that others may see and look to us and say, I want that. I need that in my life. Lord, let our lives be the, the gospel. Let our fruits be the gospel. Let everything that emanates from our lives be the gospel, Lord Father, that people may look and say, what is the hope that is in you? That we may be given an opportunity to share the love of Christ. Oh, Lord Father, it's not anything that we do, but all that you do. Lord, remove anything that doesn't belong. Lord, let there be no room in our hearts but for you. Let Jesus fill our hearts. Let every aspect of our life, let our household, let our family, let those who come in contact with us know that there's room for nothing else in our life but your son Jesus who lives in us. So Lord Father, I pray that you equip every, every leader here, every person standing here today, Lord Father, bless them, guide them, equip them, show them, Lord Father, the immeasurable work that is happening in their life that they are able to do the good things that you call us to do, that we may prove ourselves, Lord Father, worthy of the calling to which you've called us. Lord Father, thank you for those who stand here. Thank you for this church. Thank you for the obedience. Thank you for those who stand here and say, I love you, Lord. I'm here because I acknowledge you. I surrender to you. And I declare that you are my Lord and you are my King. And that all that I do is for your honor and honor alone. Your glory and your glory alone. So Lord Father, I pray that in the coming days, and oh how much more difficult it is. Oh how the world hates us. Oh how the enemy tries to stop us, Lord Father. Lord Father, may you equip us, protect us, guide us, and teach us in your ways. That every step points to your Son. Lord Father, thank you for your word that is holy and pure. Thank you for your message that is life. Lord Father, may you take us into the coming days to take this church where it needs to go, that you may equip us to do the ministries that you've called us to work, that you may give us the courage, the boldness to share with others the truth that is in us, to share the love of Christ, to speak the truth, to call to those to repentance. To let others know that to turn, to come after you, is a decision between life and death. So Lord Father, thank you for this day. This great day when we can kneel before your presence. And to look to all the things that you've given to us. And to know that you've given us all things. All things necessary to build your church. Lord Father, may we be the living stones you've called us to be. May we live out as the living temples as you've called us to be. And we, together, in unity and harmony, know that there is no one too far removed from the love of Christ. That this world is in desperate need of you. That this world needs the gospel. Yes. I thank you, Lord Father, for, for equipping these faithful servants here. May you equip us to move out, to share and to glorify your name for your for your kingdom. I thank you for this wonderful and glorious day. I thank you for the message. I thank you for the worship. And I thank you for all gathered here. It's in Jesus' mighty and holy name that I give thanks. Amen. Amen. God bless you to all of you. If you have prayers, if there's anything that you need uh, as we dismiss. My brother? Yes, my wife asked, my wife, what? my wife Maria asked that you hold her up in prayer. She's had a had a bad cough all week and um, she went to the clinic and the doctors gave her some antibiotics and, but she's still coughing really bad and she asked that we would hold her up. Let's lift up our, our sister Maria in our prayers this, this uh, week. Please keep her in your prayers. Let's lift her up. I know others are ill. Let's pray for one another. Let's encourage and lift up one another. We need each other. Amen? Mm -hmm. We're a team. We're a family. 
And oh, I give thanks to the Lord for this team. I, th I give thanks to the Lord for this family. I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. I praise the Lord. Well, maybe in heaven. But other than that, I'd, I'd rather be here. God bless you. Thank you so much. My brother Mark, thank you for a powerful message. You stand dismissed. God bless you.